Good afternoon everyone and welcome on board the Sunset Safari. No different from this morning though, we're probably not going to be seeing the sunsets. And for those of you who were not on the very brief Sunset Safari, it was caught short due to some very drizzly, rainy conditions. But thankfully that appears to have cleared up and we're not expecting any more moisture this afternoon. So fingers crossed the safari will continue uninterrupted for the next three hours. My name is Scott, if you haven't met me before, and I'm teamed up with Andrew on camera this afternoon. As you got to see, we had a vervet monkey sitting up in a dead knobthorn tree ahead of us. It seemed like it was quite nervous, and just before we went live, it was kind of jumping from branch to branch, trying to get a better view of its surroundings. We're not sure if it was looking for a troop, other monkeys, or maybe it's seen a leopard in the area. We did not hear any alarm calls though, and usually monkeys will ring out a loud <coughs> if they see a leopard or any other large predators. So not convinced that anything is here, but we thought we'd just stop and make sure that the monkey hadn't seen anything and also give you guys an opportunity to see it because we don't see them as often as we would like. Now we've got some great news that a lot of you will be happy to hear about. There are Rumours of a young male leopard by the name of Sindile, who we've been following closely for the last few months. And he was seen somewhere on our boundary with Arethusa. So we're going to head off into that direction and see if we can't find him there. So good prospects for us. And Jamie and Viam are heading out up into the northeastern corner of Juma towards Buffalo's or Dam to see if there's anything of interest over there. Texan, the, one of the Juma guides, was out this morning and he said there wasn't much going on, but the pack of wild dogs, it's 12 pups and three adults, so a total of 15 dogs, were in a similar area to where they were seen yesterday, right up in the north of Buffalo's. Oak. So still not close to us, but the good news is they are lurking closer to our territory than they had before and maybe in the coming days they will move further south and we will get a treat to see them again. Now if any of you are joining for the first time, it's great to have you on board and just a few little things that are very important that you know that this is a live safari, it's happening this very second and we would love to hear your comments and thoughts so for you to send them through to us you can hashtag Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Got Nikki and Jess in the final control room this afternoon, and their job is to choose which picture or which vehicle to cut to feed your guys' questions through to us. Well, that's where they are. And I believe you cannot hear me very well, so the signal is not good. So we're going to send you across to the up. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a rather thankfully drive sunset safari. Seems as though the rain has cleared away for the moment and we've got plenty of time to head out with a blank slate and see what animals we can find. Now for those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie and I have Viam on camera with me this afternoon. Viam the wildebeest. We're going to go out and see if we can spot the various animals that are out in Juma. Now for those of you who don't know, this is a live safari, so everything you're seeing on your screen is happening right here on Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Sabi Sands. And we're also an interactive safari, so you can send us through your questions or your comments to hashtag safari live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, as I said, we're working with a blank slate. We're not too sure what was happening out and about this morning because it started to rain but we've set off to explore the drainage lines around Boyatella Lodge and we've come across a rather sweet herd of Nyala. Now a little bit earlier the young males were sparring. I was hoping they might continue again. Everything seems to be in high spirits now that the rain has cleared up and I am 
including myself in that grouping. Let's see what these young boys are up to. Nice mixed herd tucked away. A couple of adult females and then these young males like the one off to the left. He's going to disappear into the or behind the fallen knob thorn. But they definitely look happier and a great deal fluffier than when I saw them looking rather bedraggled this morning. It does set a rather nice peaceful starting tone to this afternoon's safari. Looks as though they're going to loop around to the left. So let me see if I can reposition just to get a nice visual of them as they come out of this drainage line. I've been looking around carefully for Karula. This is one of her preferred spots. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Karula is one of the female, the older female leopard and the dominant female leopard in this territory. We are perched rather precariously on a precipice of this drainage line. And even the birds are rather cheerfully heralding a slightly drier patch. As wonderful as this rain has been, it would be nice to see the sun again. It's been a couple of days since I last saw it. Just do a quick check around this corner. See if we can get a nice view of these Inyala coming through. Hello everybody. There's nine of them here. I think you can probably only see eight shifting about. A really, really nice mixture and you can see the perfect in-betweeners. You've got the nice beautiful tan colored females and then these adolescent males who are just starting to get their full-on male coat. Oh, it sounds as though Scott has found you a lovely rare Gabar goshawk sighting so let's head across and see those and I will catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone, and I've called you onto our vehicle, I need some help from the ornithologists out there. We had a brief glimpse of this bird earlier, before it flew off, and it looked pitch black in coloration. There it goes again. Oh, I don't think it is a Gabar goshawk, which was my initial guess. And sadly, the position we were in didn't allow for any of you guys to get a decent view either. Whew, interesting stuff. The, the reason why I rushed you back is because if it was a melanistic Gabar Gossok, they're extremely rare. We don't get to see them in, er, er, very often. And basically, what melanistic means is it just means it's a pitch black form. So a black panther or a black leopard is a Essentially a melanistic one. Sorry, Andrew. I just need to Which one is it? Here on the top right. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't see any white bars under its tail nor its wings. It also didn't have a red beak or red legs. So that writes off the Gabar Gossok and I'm at a loss for words as to what it could have been. I'm just going to page over one or two pages. Um, and I'm wondering if it's not possibly a lesser spotted eagle which has come back from its migration and maybe it was just an optical illusion with these white clouds that made it look very black in color. Anyway, that one's going to be a mystery for me. I cannot hazard a call, so not too sure 
what to say, but maybe some of you guys will have a better idea than me and feel free to send that through to us. What Nikki's just suggested is that we can play you a quick replay. Maybe they can slow it down a little bit so that you get to see it as it takes off and get to see underneath its wings. Not going to be an easy one to identify though because of the very brief sighting we've had on it, of it. But that's the great thing about being on these live safaris with all of you guys. We can get a lot of help and you guys also get such great views from wherever you're watching in the world. So I'm hoping that you guys are going to come to the rescue again. Sorry to rush you away from Jamie and what sounded like quite an interesting Inyala sighting. So we're going to play you the clip quickly and have a look, see what you think. And we're going to carry on driving in the meantime. And if any of you can deduce what you think it may be, hashtags or again, send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. about that mystery bird. Sounds as though Scott has spotted something very, very unusual. Now, Wildebeest and I haven't yet spotted anything that unusual. Just as you went across, there was a drongo, a fork-tailed drongo, which is a type of bird that many of the regular viewers will be familiar with. And he was imitating the call of the long-tailed or the magpie shrike. I actually genuinely thought it was a magpie shrike until I looked at it. And it truly is quite astounding how they can do that, those birds. The most phenomenal mimics. I've left our family of Inyala for now. I'm on a mission to see what else we can find. those in Yala for now. Clown Sharon, welcome to the Sunset Safari. It's great to have you aboard. And you would like to know if the Nyala coat gets darker as they get older. Maybe probably in much the same way as giraffe do. And as far as I can tell, no. If anything, it seems to be the opposite, at least for the females. Sometimes the lambs look a lot darker than their mothers when they are born for lightening up a little bit with age if they are females and obviously as the older male uh, the older youngsters that are male get older they start to darken a little bit with age but that's just them reaching their natural masculine coat and then after that it stays pretty much the same color for the rest of their lives the one thing that will change and will actually is the very tips of their horns so for the male in Yala, they start to lighten at the tip, almost getting an ivory-like color. And that's the sign of a very healthy male in his prime. And you see that with all of the spiral horned antelope. So from the bushbuck to the Nyala, Kudu and Elant, all four of them in that family, they'll start to get the ivory tips. I'm stopping for a blacksmith lapwing. See if he's going to stop and let us get a view of him. I just wanted to listen to the sound he's making because it's a wonderful background to the name Blacksmith Lapwing. There you go. Can you hear that ticking, almost hammering sound? And for this beautiful black and white bird, that's what gives its name the blacksmith lapwing. It sounds like a blacksmith's anvil trying to shape iron. And these little birds will be nesting soon. They make little shallow indents in the ground.
out. It seems as though, since we are talking about birds, that Scott has relocated his mystery bird. So let's see if we can try and figure out what it is, and I will catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone. Um, seems like the birds are getting a lot of action this afternoon. Oh, we found the same bird again here and I'm still not too sure what to think of it. It's got very narrow stovepipe leggings over its legs which are a bit obstructed by some branches in the foreground. And I'm leaning towards it being either a Warburg's eagle or a lesser spotted eagle. Well done there, Andrew. But can't be sure. Anyway, some of you may have come up with your own deductions as to what you think it may be. I'm going with now, after a second look, either a Warburg's eagle or a lesser spotted. But let me know your thoughts. While we get out of this tricky little predicament we got ourselves into here. Mavis would like to know if juvenile eagles or birds of prey will have the same colours as the adults and most often they don't and it can take many years for some of the raptors to get their adult plumage. In the case of the bat alert can take about eight years and a lot of them will also take quite some time to get their adult plumage. And then Sharon in Pittsburgh mentioned that because of its size as well as the fact that it had feathered legs, it could, well it is an eagle and you completely correct Sharon, the Birds of prey that lack feathers on their legs are not eagles. So that's one of the prerequisites to be an eagle. You have to have feathered legs, except if you are one of the snake eagles. They somehow got eagle status, eagle status without having feathered legs. Well, very happy to hear that James in Kansas City agrees with one of my potential options. And he, he's going with the lesser spotted eagle from the coloration under the wings and the tail. So, thanks for your contribution there, James. I think it certainly could be, and it would have been the first lesser spotted eagle I've seen since we, or well, since they've rather returned from their migration. Another thing to look for on the lesser spotted eagle is that they do have patches on their upper wing and on their back, but it was difficult to see from those angles. Not too much going on here at the treehouse waterhole. But sometimes it's nice just to stop, look around, listen, and see if we aren't missing anything or overlooking a camouflaged predator. And Julia in Houston's interested to know how much rain we got last night. And not enough to make a considerable difference to the level of this waterhole, that's for sure. It was very, very gentle pitter-patter drizzle. And it was hardly rain at the best of times. But even that thick, fine mist would have contributed to a little bit of moisture for the vegetation. But I would have said maybe one or two inches of rain, one inch maximum over the 24 hour period that it was wet. So not a lot and we certainly need a lot more in the coming months. Now I'm not sure if any of you were on drive with me when I stopped at this water hole to allow you to take a screenshot so that we can do a time lapse of how the vegetation is 
changing in colour as well as how the water level is increasing at this waterhole. So I'm just going to stop in that same spot now and hopefully some of you who were on that drive will be able to take another screenshot and it was just about sure I'm going to have to probably help Andrew but we had the weaver's nest and that's something that's also going to change and a little bit further to the right so I think we had a bit of the main trunk of that tree oh, a little bit left a little bit more perfect so feel free to take some screenshots and it's going to be remarkable to note the change in the water level the weavers nests that you can see bubbling up over there those are all last summer's stock and the weavers the village weavers will be back soon with a hive of activity we will spend a lot of time watching them build their nests it's incredible how intricately they can weave blades of grass with using only their beak imagine having your hands tied behind your back and you're using your feet to hold on to a branch whilst using your mouth to weave something that's what they do did take pictures last time we were here of that same scene it would be wonderful if you could pop them onto Twitter with the older one and the more new one so we can get an idea of how much it's changing I find it incredible how quickly the trees react to the summer months and I think often people overlook the massive changes in scenery but if it is springtime where you are, even if it's autumn or fall, it's worth taking a close look at just how quickly things change. And if you pick one tree or one bush, then you should therefore be able to focus on the massive changes. I'm not sure if somebody's trying to call me. Somebody. On the Game Drive channel. Last station, are you looking for? Well, maybe it's just playing up, that wouldn't be a first. that some of you are still trying to work out what that eagle is that we saw earlier the mystery eagle and Diane's just made a comment that she thinks it was the Wahlberg so we've got varying views from the different guests that are on the safari with us and I am happy to sit on the fence I'm glad that the two birds that I did think it was one of the two the lesser spotted or the Wahlberg's eagle have both come up as your potential suggestions I was just making sure there was no tracks on the road here but it was an optical illusion so nothing to show you but it's important for first-time viewers to know that tracking the animals is something that we really have to invest a lot of time in otherwise we won't find you any good sightings and it's the tracks of the animals that often lead us to some interesting interesting sightings i'm in a good spot andrew can you see that funny branch up in the tree there it's not the best angle but it's not a funny branch that's for sure it's a tiny pearl spotted owlet. 
can you believe it how small that little bird is and as it turns its head away from us now it's looking at us but watch carefully as it turns its head away it's got false eyes on the back of its head. Let's see if it doesn't look away again. That's very characteristic of the pearl spotted owlet. There it is. Awesome. Well, it seems like the predatory birds are showing us a really good time this afternoon. I'm interested to try and get you into a slightly better position though, so let's take a chance here. It could fly off. But on the same breath, we could get lucky and get you know, a much closer view. No. There it goes. So, and he's going for it. And it's just great for you to get an idea of how small it is. It's probably only about four inches in height. And because we didn't get the best view of it, I'm going to just try and find the owls in the book for you. There we go. And I'm not sure exactly why it's flicking up its tail, maybe with excitement. So, there's two tiny owlets that we could get confused with. One is the African barred owlet, and the other one is the one we saw, the pearl spotted. But as you can see, those clear false eyes on the back of the pearl spotted's head differentiates it from the very similar African barred owlet. And aren't they beautiful little birds? Quite ferocious predators, actually. And interestingly enough, I've seen a pearl spotted owlet with a kill of a laughing dove, which is a bird of basically the same size as itself. So that's just how hardcore they are. They can catch prey their own size. And those eyes on the back of its head will be a form of protection, I guess, from larger predators as they'll feel that they are permanently being watched. No different to some of the moths that we are going to see as the summer months unfold that have large black spots resembling eyes on their wings. And it can throw predators off as they will not be sure what exactly this animal may be, even though it's just a tiny little moth. Those, those large eyes or false eyes on their wings can help to create a very good decoy to confuse their predators. about the village weavers that we are going to see at Treehouse Dam in the coming months and Judith is interested to know if they will leave those old nests hanging there or if they'll tear them down. They may well tear down a few of them in order to create space on the prime spots so that's in all likelihood what will happen they'll strip down some of the older nests even with a lot of the moisture we're getting now you'll find some of the older nests may simply begin to rot and break off naturally. But it'll be a combination of those two things. So I'll point it out there, Judith. That's something we can expect to see. Interestingly, even the brand new nests that get built by the males, only the males build the nests and then invite the ladies in to come and have a look. And if the ladies agree and appreciate the workmanship of the male, they will go ahead and mate and occupy that nest. However, if they don't like the male's work, they will illustrate this quite clearly and rip the nest down. So, not easy being a male weaver if you're not a handyman. Um, so that's something else that's quite interesting with the weavers. 
Now, we are slowly approaching the general area of where we could bump into this young male leopard I let you know about a bit earlier. So it's important that we all focus now. No more fooling about. And we are going to hopefully in the next few minutes find him. I'm going to turn onto another road. This road that we're heading on now is actually the southern boundary of Juma. And it runs from the west to the east. And the road that he was actually seen on was the boundary between Juma and Arethusa, which runs north-south. But we're not far from there, and on a cool day like this, he could have moved into this area quite easily. surprise I haven't seen one of you guys for a while just gonna get into a slightly better spot I did see one other zebra further off in the distance but it's a much thicker vegetation so this one will be our best one to view And while we enjoy looking at it, we can answer a question from Hilma and her granddaughter, Joella. Very happy to hear that you guys are watching. And they're interested for an update on Tingana and Quatile, which were two leopards that, according to Joella, who's just six year old, were playing tag the other day. And Yoela is interested to know if they're still playing tag or if they've had enough of their fun. And as far as we know, they haven't been seen again. They could still be playing tag. They often play tag for three to five days. And then they get tired of playing and they'll take quite a long break before they play their next game. <laughs> but we'll do our best to find them again for you. It was really interesting to watch them. There's the other zebra that I saw off behind this one in the foreground. And zebra love feeding on short green grass, which there's a multitude of at the moment. I'm just going to have to pull over the road quickly. We've got another game drive vehicle arriving. So we're going to make space for them. And it looks like Sean. He's a serious character from Arethusa. And he's creeping along very slowly here. And he's probably going to try and say something funny about me, but all the Arethusa guys do that, so it's the norm. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Sean, how are you? Delicious, and you? Good, thanks. Hello, Reese. Hi, how are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Well, thank you. What's up? Very good, very good. So there's Sean, everyone, who you get to hear a lot about, but you don't often get to see him, and his tracker, Reese, who we are indebted for for many, many sightings. Do you guys have any updates? Really? Okay. Is it the, is it the Birmingham with the funny eyes? No. No, no, he's chilling with his other three brothers, white cloth open. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Because we... Because we had the, the Birmingham's, uh, one of them, m mating with, or at least attempting to mate with what we thought was an Inkahuma, but it could have been a Styx, we're not too sure. Any news on, any news on the, the three Inkahumas that were floating around, not, no sign of them? Okay. All right. Escape is the order of the day. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. 
somewhere around there, but I'm sure on your side. Yeah, maybe your side. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Reese. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Have a great <laughs> afternoon, life. everyone. <laughs> So a lot of you have probably noticed that we are doing something a little bit differently, especially if you've been following the show for quite some time now. And we've always had this awkward kind of moment where we've battled to be able to show you the guides that we're speaking to, but we've trying to come up with a solution to show you the, the guys. A lot of you come out here on safari, so it'll be nice to know who your potential guides may be. But we do try our best to obviously avoid the guests who may not be so happy about being on camera. So that's why the cameramen like Andrew now may have to pull off some quick maneuvers with the camera in order to not show all the guests. So just to fill you in on that. And I think Andrew did a great job there. So well done. Obviously it was made difficult because Sean had a passenger in the seat right next to him, which is usually not the case. Anyway, Hilma and Joella, we are in the general area of where those leopards were last seen playing tag. So we'll make sure we let you know if we get any more updates on them. And some of you may have heard Reese, who is the tracker sitting up on that very peculiar seat on the hood of the vehicle. And it's the best place to be as a tracker. You've got advantage points over the road to spot the tracks. And you're also a little bit distanced away from the chatter of the guides and the guests so you can focus on scanning and searching not only for tracks but also for animals so that's why he was up front there it's great fun traveling on the tracker seat it's important to hold on tightly though because obviously if you fall over you're going to have the vehicle going over you but that doesn't happen because everyone holds on to the seat very well but something to bear in mind if you do you ever get offered a ride on a tracker seat, make sure you hold on tight. As I was saying though, Reese, who is the tracker, mentioned that Opa, who is our resident mechanic and he was obviously offered Arethusa fixing some of their vehicles, saw young Madiba or Sindile or Shadow's Cub, whichever of those three names you'd like to call him. So we're going to check her out here very closely. And I've got good news everyone, Jamie has found some male lion tracks. She thinks it's just tracks of one male and she is off on foot now exploring and searching to see if she can work out where that lion's gone. So exciting stuff happening there. And it was basically here that this young male leopard was seen apparently heading into Juma. So I'm just going to creep along here very slowly and you guys can all help to scan in these bushes and see if we can't find him anywhere. He's incredibly well camouflaged so don't look too closely for a leopard, look more for a strange outline or silhouette or shape of a leopard not necessarily the colors or the flick of an ear or a tail i'm trying to check carefully on the ground for any tracks i can see reese's boot marks here where he's driven around where he's walked around but the ground has become very very hard after the rain that we've had, it kind of solidifies no different. Ah, we're in luck. You can see Opa. So he's obviously on his way back from fixing the vehicles at Arethusa. And he's courteously stopping, but he doesn't realize that we need his help. So he's going to come across shortly. And let's get an update from the mechanic of all people. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Opa. How are you? Very good. So I uh, hear you've got some good news for us. Did you see that young Madoda Indra here? Yeah, I'm already seeing Ellen in the morning somewhere. Past the border. On the other side of this river? Yeah, I don't know. How far? Close, or? Uh, three to four minutes before. 
Nick, Max the exit that fall. Thanks, Opa. Thank you for your help. Okay, well, there we have it. First-hand information from the mechanic as to where he spotted the leopard. And one thing that I really love about life out on safari and in these remote places is that you forge friendships with people of all different walks of life and professions that find themselves out here and it really does make life interesting having these friendships with people from so many different cultures and backgrounds to where we or yourself may have come from as an individual Quite a while ago, it was this morning, but according to Opa, you heard him say good morning. You may have heard it, this diesel engine was droning quite loudly. But it was a few hours ago that this leopard was seen, and in this very cool weather, it could have moved off quite some distance. However, it's quite open here, and I think a good spot to off road not too thick and let's see if we don't have any luck driving through here carefully we may stop and listen to see if we can hear any alarm calls Let's just stop here and scan around and listen. Maybe we'll get lucky and spot him here somewhere. And while we do that, we can stop and answer a question from Ashley in Missouri. And Ashley, glad, glad to hear you watching because there is indeed a fireside chat tonight. It will be for the last half an hour of the broadcast so for those of you again who are new to the show at the uh, at the end of every week every Sunday evening for the last half an hour of the broadcast what we do is we sit around a campfire play you some highlights of the week some of the clips and also answer some of your questions about those clips and about anything you may be interested about not necessarily pertaining to what we are doing on safari I think it's worth just scanning this area the leopard might be somewhere nearby The termite mound on the right there might be a good place to check, Andrew. They love lying up on termite mounds. Nothing here though. Hmm. Nothing there. It's not sunny, so... Oh, are we in luck? I think we are. <laughs> Some of you probably realized long before you actually got to see him that I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> but I tried my best to make it a surprise for all of you. But we've got lucky and we're going to get a little bit closer to this leopard. Can you believe it? Thanks, Opa. We owe him one. We actually owe him more than one. We owe him many, many favours for all the work he's done getting these vehicles up and running for us. And while we get a bit closer to the leopard, I just want to make sure I get onto the Game Drive channel to let the vehicles know. And Nikki is going to let Candace from the Sabi Sands know, as they do need to do, I think, some more treatments on this leopard. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that once we get into position. But basically, He's a young male, and regardless of his age though, he managed to catch a domestic dog which had broken into the reserve from the surrounding communities, and the dog 
may very well have had rabies and rabies is a very deadly disease and it can cause a massive outbreak and cause harm to many many animals not only leopards but a lot of wild animals that live out here so they exterminated the dog and sent it off for tests to see if it was rabid but in the meantime they've inoculated this leopard for rabies just in case He might be playing a little bit of hide and seek with us, which is actually not normal for him. He's usually so relaxed, but we'll get you a great view shortly. Hello, young Cindy Le. Hello, boy. Well, maybe he's just had a lonely day out with his mother off hunting, and now he's decided to use us as his playmates. Look at how well he's camouflaged in there. I'm just playing with the game drive radio here. Give me a second. It appears to no longer be working. Just going to turn it on and off and see if that changes anything. So, as I've said, he's a young male and his mother could very well be off hunting. He's still reliant on her for meals. Having said that, though, he can catch and kill for himself. As I've just said, he caught and killed. Well, he didn't actually kill the dog, but. He was probably in the process of getting there. And it's not uncommon for leopard cubs from the moment they're born to be left alone by their mother as they go out hunting. Interestingly though, for this young male, his mother was seen mating about three weeks to a month ago, which means she's going to have a new generation to take care of and he's going to take the back seat. And he's a little bit young to be doing that. He's just over a year of age and usually anywhere from 18 months to two years will be the time that their mothers will give birth to the next generation and therefore they will need to become independent. But just like humans there's variations in the animals out here and the decisions they make and it appears that she is going to give birth a little bit sooner than expected. What I'm guessing is going to happen is that he's just going to slot in as the older brother babysitter who stays with the young cubs when the mother's off hunting and when she returns to call mainly her two little cubs to go and feed on carcasses he's going to continue getting easy meals I have seen that happen in the past let me see if the game drive channel is working now that I've turned it on and off hmm. no no luck well, maybe if Jamie's radio is working, she can just relay to the guides that we have found this leopard off Triple M, a couple of hundred meters north of the signboards. Nikki's just going to relay that message to her. Aren't we so lucky to have found him? I mean, we are parked probably 10 meters away at the moment, yet it's very, very difficult to see him. Hello, boy. He's got such a pretty face. Flawless for now. But that will change as he becomes big and old, or hopefully he becomes big and old. He's not quite there yet, as are most young leopards. They've got many obstacles that they face. Lions, other big male leopards, wild dogs. But he is on the road to becoming a big male. And won't it be wonderful for all of us involved to see him develop? Well, 
Well, it looks like he's had enough hide and seek for now. And now it's time to do some grooming and scratching behind the ear. Well, we've got two questions through, one from Caroline in Missouri, and another one through from, I always get the names confused, um, anyway, two of you are interested to know if The inoculation of this animal a few days ago has caused him to be a little bit more nervous of us. And yes, I think it may have given him a little bit of a fright and behavior that he's certainly not used to from the vehicles. But it's not unrecoverable. And already now we can see how he's relaxed with the vehicle and back to his normal self. And it's probably also because he has hardly been seen since that time that nobody has been able to reassure him that we're not here to harm him even though that event was abnormal to how we usually act around him and understandably he can be a little bit more nervous of us after that but even if we never saw him again as a result of inoculating him it would be a better option than him dying of rabies so I mean it is what it is and I think it's certainly the right thing that has happened and even if he does get a little bit nervous of us we can reassure him over time that we don't mean trouble and that was Sandra and Caroline who were interested to know about that I'm not sure on what he's seen behind us. I'm trying to look back and see if there's anything moving about there, any dwarf mongooses or potential prey for him. But can't see anything just yet. You may have also heard a little bit of loud squawking earlier. I saw some lilac breasted rollers having an argument with one another. And I'll be sure to point out the audio if we hear it again. Sadly, they were out of view, as we would have tried to show them to you. I wonder when last his mother did make a kill for them. Even though he can catch his own small preys, never caught anything large that we're aware of, other than the domestic dog the other day. But that's not really fair prey. It doesn't belong out here, so we won't include that. But he's looking fairly hungry now, and we saw his mother hunting yesterday afternoon, unsuccessfully, sadly, but had a great afternoon with her. And obviously she hasn't had any luck between now and then, otherwise she would have called him back. 
see if we can reposition. Well, it's important that I warn some of you in advance that there is a chance that he may need to be inoculated again this afternoon. So whether we're around for that or not, I'm not too sure, but it is a reality of what needs to happen. Twitter's just sent through another question and she's interested to know when we will get back the rabies results from that dog and it's out of our control and jurisdiction basically Elise so we're waiting to get that update from the Sabi Sands I'm guessing that because they do want to inoculate him again the results were positive for rabies. Well, that's just a guess. As far as I was told, you would have that initial inoculation as a backup in case. And if the dog did prove positive, then it would require a series of further inoculations. But let's just wait and see. Hopefully, we'll have some more lights on the matter before anything else happens to him. Isn't he such a beautiful animal? Yep, he could do with the meal, so that's good prospects for us. He doesn't look full bellied at all. And maybe he's gonna make his second live kill. His first one was actually not a kill, he caught a gerbil and then released it. So he hasn't actually managed to kill anything live on screen. We've seen him with a dead Franklin and a dead mongoose before. But maybe this afternoon things will change. Just going to loop ahead again. Always try and take the path of least resistance, which is sometimes easier than others. For now it's okay. But whatever trees you do see us driving over, don't be alarmed. We know which species can tolerate a bit of a battering and which species can't. I know exactly where he's heading and that's a termite mound where we've seen him lying up before which we will not be able to access from this side of the riverbed so he may have to do a big loop around in order to get there. Oh, hang on. I've just seen a Franklin. And I think he may try to be stalking it. Can you see it in there? And it's just down to our left at kind of 9 or 10. Now Andrew's straight onto it. Let's watch closely here. I can't see the leopard anymore, but it was off to the right. And I think he's, he's dropped down into this riverbed, which is going to be a great place for him to stalk closer to these Franklin. And see if we can get him in that little gap down there in the riverbed. I think he might be able to, not the Franklin, the, the leopard, to the right. He's to the right of the Franklin. Just down in there. If you zoom in, you should be able to get up. And a little bit further right. Oh no, is that his tail there? Or am I dreaming? That might be his tail there. No, that's a branch. You know, I'm sending Andrew on a bit of a wild goose chase, but he is down in there. 
somewhere. He's just so well camouflaged that it's difficult to see him, but I'm fairly certain that he is interested in trying to catch one of these Franklins. He's not at all close to them for now. This is a crested Franklin that appears to be on the go slow, taking a breather from feeding. And this young male leopard's best option for catching a Franklin will be to lie in ambush and wait for the Franklin to come feeding towards him slowly and then he can just pounce on top of them for him to move his big body towards them will be quite a feat. Oh, things are looking good. The leopard is in the thick vegetation directly where Andrew is at the bottom right of your screen you can kind of see uh, that log he's just in there it's very difficult to see him though but he is in there I don't think Andrew's got the right angle from where he is elevated up on a slightly different position to me but the leopard is hiding somewhere in there. I can see him with my binoculars, but for some reason you guys don't have the right angle. Uh, apologies everyone, I've been pointing in the completely wrong direction but things are still looking up these Franklin are generally feeling in his direction and even though they're very small prey leopards will feed on just about anything that they can overpower even if it's catfish tiny little fledglings still too small to fly out of their nests lizards rodents anything that they can overpower and especially young males who are learning the ropes Andrew, I've got a better bearing now of where he is so that you can, you see this, you see this buffalo thorn, this little one, if just if you go down on that angle into the riverbed, you'll find him in there, there he is. So not easy to see, but he's in there. You can just see him twitching, there he goes. So still quite some distance away from these Franklin, but he's just sitting patiently in there. And rather than blundering this opportunity, he's just going to wait and hope that these birds get a little bit closer. Oh, my game drive channel seems to be working again, so that's great news. Can get a hold of Andrew. Jamie has relayed the message to everyone, and I believe Andrew is on the way. But I just want to let him know that for now, he's probably not going to have the best view. Andrew for Scots. Afternoon. Um, I believe you're interested in making your way to this Ingwe. He's currently in a riverbed, not the best visual, the one just north of. Triple M Gari Main Junction, but I do still have his love. Him. Well, what a wonderful sighting of these Franklin this has turned into. They are such pretty birds. 
Okay, copy that, Andrew. Just let me know when you get closer by and maybe you would have moved off. And one thing we can look forward to seeing is their tiny little chicks, which should be hatching in the coming months. Wonderful, wonderful colorations on those feathers. And it's using its beak to scuff up the earth looking for any little insects and or grass seeds. Just like a chicken, they are omnivorous if they have the choice. This looks like a male. Notice how there's very large spurs growing out of the back of his legs. And that's indicative of a male. And he uses those spurs for fighting. Oh, elephant dung. What are you going to find in there? Break it open. Come on. I think it's feeling embarrassed. But it will maybe have a go at this bigger pile. There we go. Nothing wrong with eating elephant dung or anything that's living within it. So carry on, little crested Franklin. We won't tell anyone. It looks like the other one may have become jealous now and is also interested in the buffet. Andrew, if you don't mind trying to get closer, close in on that new one to see if we can see any spurs on the back of its legs. You see, this is a happy pair. There's the female. She lacks the spurs on her legs. I hope you guys got a view of them. Surprisingly large spurs on the males. So this is his beautiful lady. And doesn't matter if you're male or female, elephant dung is a worthy <coughs> sorry, source of finding little tidbits to nibble on. There you can see his large spurs again. was great. Let's see if we can get a closer view of this leopard which appears to be taking a bit of a snooze in the riverbed. How does that look Andrew? You got him there? You can just reposition if need be. I think that should work. If you just go into the red leaf litter on your left, yeah. That's just about as good as it's going to get. Oh no, I've sent you on another wild goose chase. That's where I thought the leopard was. I was wrong. Super camouflage, wow. Well, what's up with my angles? I haven't got you further enough forward. Well, you'd swear this was Andrew and my first safari together, but it's not. And I just... Ah, oh, well done, Andrew. Now, even though this is an individual leopard cub, Kathy Ward would like to know what would have happened had this male had a sibling, be it male or female, when would they split up? and start seeing less of one another? And it's a good question. It will vary greatly between the individual siblings and their mothers. There's just so many variables involved in that question, Kathy, that it's a difficult one to answer with one figure. But anywhere from 18 months to two years of age, when they do become independent and their mother forces them out, any stage from then, in a typical environment, or typical scenario, would be when the siblings split up and start moving on their own. But that's not to say that they won't meet up and share kills with one another. Quarantine and Kunuma, even at two and a half years of age, were still seen co-feeding on kills. 
but anywhere from about a year and a half would be the likely age to see siblings spending less and less time together. Let's hope that we do get a successful litter with more than one cub sooner rather than later. We haven't had any luck with tiny little leopard cubs since we've been here other than a kind of two minute sighting of Karula's last cub before it got eaten by a hyena. So that was a morning of hugely mixed emotions, the joy and jubilation of, oh, big stretch, joy and jubilation of finding her cubs for the first time and then just minutes later the sadness of seeing it being killed by a hyena. Okay, well, we are going to now have to drive all the way around onto the other side of this riverbed in order to try and relocate this leopard. And we're going to send you across to Jamie while we do so for a change of scenery. And you can also check in with her on how her afternoon's been up in the northeastern reaches of Juma. See you later. Welcome back, and what wonderful news about young Sindile. I don't usually conduct my game drives in reverse, but I've just stopped for some scat that VM just noticed. Just picked it up now. Let me reposition to show you. Here we go. Now, I'm going to just hop out and have a look at these tracks and see if I can work out who this belonged to. There's two options in my mind at the moment. I just want to see if I can see the tracks. It's pretty tricky after these big rains. Let's see what we can spot. I'm going to try and be very careful about stepping on any of them. I'm almost, almost inclined to say cheetah just by looking at the smallish size of it. But it's already started to go white. If we look here, it's starting to go white around the edges. I don't really want to put my hands on it. I'll grab a stick. Just have a look here. You can see the whiteness starting to creep in. But it is still moist. Not that wet though. So this isn't as fresh as I originally thought. And that would be why there's no tracks to see. I think the rain has washed them away. I'm guessing cheetah at the moment, but it's not that fresh. It's before our rains this morning. So probably given the distance that cheetah can move in one day, probably very difficult. It's going to be very difficult for us to follow up on it, especially because we don't have a direction as to where that animal was going. Now the other thing that I picked up on earlier while you were with Scott and the magical Shadows Cub, I'm going to just keep calling him that until we have an official name, but I picked up on some lone male lion tracks heading down Gauri Katla. Now I'm really, really interested in who that could possibly be. They are not the freshest tracks, they are from sometime last night. And there are now apparently more tracks up towards Gauri Gate. So I'm going to be looping around in this direction, just looping the block. I followed the tracks down into the drainage line. And they stopped at a big pan and had a sniff around, whoever he was. And they, he'd clearly been sniffing where the Birmingham boys had been. He was standing all over their tracks and their footprints. I'm a little bit bemused. There's a couple of options in my head. One of them is it's the one remaining Birmingham boy who wasn't seen this morning. So the Birmingham boys, in case Scott didn't give you that update, they were south of Gowry, Maine on Vessel's property. Then the other option is it was one of the Salati males coming to have a sniff around at what's happening. And then the other option that I'm considering is that it could be Junior. Those are just some of the possibilities in my head. Of course, it could be a line that none of us have ever seen before. 
but those are just some of the thoughts that are in my head. Trying to work it out, followed him into the drainage line and then lost the track somewhere in there. Unfortunately, just wasn't able to tell exactly where they had gone. So I've headed back towards Gowrie Gate and onto Albury's Road, partly because I want to see if the tracks come along here towards the Gowrie Gate, but also because I heard a report that there was a herd of elephants here. And since we have been having some rather elephant-themed drives over the last few days, I thought I'd catch that wonderful breeding herd. It seems to be the same breeding herd. I wanted to try and catch them before they cross north into Buffles Hook. So far, no sign of them, but keep your eyes peeled for big shapes of grey in the dark and the gloom. Many of our loyal viewers keep track not only of our drives out along Juma, but also reports from the other guides. And of course, we're so reliant on hearing their information when some of the animals move across the boundaries into their area. Now, Sarah, who is 17 years old from Ohio, is definitely one of our regular and loyal viewers. Now, Sarah, you heard the report that... Oh, wow. <laughs> Well spotted, Via. Let me try and get a nice position here. Is here okay for you? It, I don't want to disturb them. Backwards. Yes, I think let's go backwards a little bit. We've got some rather sleepy, rather chilly giraffe. There we go. There we go. And there's a tiny, tiny little baby there. Look how good it is. Standing, its mom is lying down and the baby is standing behind and baby is still even standing shorter than mom. How cute is that? Sorry Sarah, I promise you I'll give you the update from your question in a moment. But this is just too cute for words. Come on little one. Come say hello. I'm just going to grab my binoculars. Which not sure where I put them. I tried to hide them from the rain this morning <laughs> and I'm not sure where they went. I'm trying to just see how old this little one must be, but very, very cute. Ah, oh, there they are. Too sweet. Hello. Look at you peeking out from behind mommy. It's okay. Too sweet. And look at all of those ox pickers all over the baby, even at such a young age. Now it's hard to tell, I'd say, this little one, because its ossicones are, so the little horns on top of its head, because those are upright now, I would put it at about two months old maybe. It takes them, oh, 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 so cute. It takes them about a month to straighten up. But just imagine, so much shorter than mom, and mom is lying down. Very well spotted, Viam. The wildebeest has got his eyes peeled this afternoon. Oh, mom's leaning over to have a scratch. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Little bit of love there between... Mom and baby. Oh, <laughs> baby stuck her tongue in mom's ear. Oh, that is so sweet. Look at all of that affection there. Oh, having a cuddle from mom. Hmm. <laughs> 
I have never ever seen giraffes being so tender to their babies as this one's being. I've never seen this. Oh, cute man. That is too precious for words. I hope you guys are taking lots of screenshots. I know there's sticks in the way, but this is still just the most wonderful giraffe sighting with a baby I think I've ever seen. There's just something in the air in Juma at the moment. Lots of babies from that adorable baby elephant to this wonderful little baby giraffe. Usually when you see them, they're separate from their mothers by quite a distance, just because their moms don't want to draw attention to them. So this is really the first time I've ever seen such a show of affection between them. Oh, she's itchy. I've also never seen a giraffe do that either. Have a scratch, almost like a cat might do with the leg, back leg lifted up. That's incredible. I didn't even know they were capable of that. <laughs> that is too precious now it's not uncommon for that mom to be lying down like that she's just taking a break you generally don't see them with their heads resting on the ground but they do fold their legs up underneath them and then lie down settle down like that oh, baby Come on, Mom. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Here we go. Mom is now up. And did you see the way that she got up like that in that sort of wonky motion? The only other animal I've seen get up like that is a camel. And I wonder if baby's going to go and try and suckle now. I'm not sure how long mom would have been lying down. Oh, <laughs> tail to the face. Now bottom off, oh, that baby's tiny. Oh my word. Oh, and Mom's going to head off into the thick block. Now, I know that one of our viewers, Pinky Swear, you were keen to see some zebras and giraffe. Well, there you go. I hope you're enjoying probably one of the best giraffe sightings I think I've ever had, just by sheer cuteness factor. And look at its tiny short neck compared to its leg length. Such a funny little disproportionate thing baby giraffe are. Even more so than the adults. I was looking at the ossicones a little bit earlier to try and age the giraffe. But the other thing I'm trying to see under the belly is whether or not it still has that umbilical cord attached to it and Deborah I know that you were asking it whether or not it still has that and I think I did see something dangling down and that puts this little baby and just seeing its height now next to mom it's probably under a month old so how magical is that what a special little thing Wow, quite the most adorable giraffe sighting I think I've ever had. And just think about the incredible, I don't know, the whole incredible process of the creation and the birth of a baby giraffe. To be able to create that little baby and then the poor thing, its first start to life is a two meter drop down from mom, which I imagine must be quite the shock when you hit the ground. But this baby is then up and running within a couple of minutes, stable on those long, long legs. And as we've learned with a deciduous hoof 
M pots it. It's a deciduous hoof capsule covering its hooves that, so that it doesn't hurt its mother while it's in her stomach or in her uterus. But really such a magical sighting. I absolutely love it. Thank you, Wildebeest, for that epic giraffe sighting. Really, truly magical. Now, these two have moved off into quite a thick block, and given that baby's age and the magical sighting we just had, we really don't want to go pushing after to try and see it again. But we've had our very special tender moments, and that's what's so magical about this time of year. Even if we do get the odd drive that's rained out a little bit, we get a little bit soggy, everything's starting to go green. Lots of animals mating around the place and then lots of these wonderful new births. So for somewhere in the region of 15 months, that mother carried that baby. It's such an investment for giraffe. And they only ever have one baby. It's usually, it's always one baby. There's one or two recorded cases of births of twins. Most commonly people think they've seen giraffe twins just because the mother's a little bit further away and they can't see it. So they think that they're seeing twins with one mother when in fact it's just one, one baby with one mother each. this magical little giraffe sighting that we've just had. Scott has relocated young Shadow's cub. Let's see what he's seeing for now and get back to you a little bit later. Well, so happy to hear that Jamie found you such a tiny baby giraffe. They are incredibly cute. And so is this young male. We have wedged ourselves into quite a thick area in order to get you this view of him but at least we did manage to relocate him and it looks like he's just taking some time to relax here now well the sabi sands management are with us in the sighting deciding what to do next. They do plan on inoculating him. I haven't been able to speak to them clearly yet as to whether or not they've got any more results, how many more inoculations will need to be done. But whether we show you guys or not, that's up to you whether you would like to see the next inoculation. I'm guessing a lot of you have already seen enough of that, but it's a democratic world that we live in. So we'll leave it up to you guys to decide whether you do want to watch the inoculation if the guys manage to get into a decent spot or whether you don't. Chattering you can hear is Andrew letting the Sabi Sands know that he will get himself out of the way shortly. Obviously he's making the most of this beautiful sighting. They are tricky animals to come by the leopards and as a guide here you like to try and get as many of the elusive animals ticked off before your guests last drive so that you don't end up in a panic. And that's exactly what Andrew is doing now. I won't just gonna leave it and go. So then a lion will uh, be in waiting. Yeah, yeah. Well done to Andrew on camera for spotting this leopard. Otherwise I certainly wouldn't have spotted it. And it gives you a good idea just of how thick this area is that we're in as Andrew zooms out. Okay. 
And I'm sure the Sabe Sands, as soon as Andrew has moved out, are trying to get into a good spot here. Yeah? There he goes. Um, but it is going to be very tricky when shooting with a dart gun. If the dart hits any little twig or blade of grass, it will deflect in the wrong direction. So they're going to try their best to make sure they don't have any misfires but that's what he thinks of this idea so they've got their work cut out for them the Salvi Sands because he's taken a clear notice of the vehicle that they're traveling which thankfully is different to all of our vehicles and on seeing them they have run off so clever young leopard and he wasn't interested in the Sabi Sands and the, the Sabi Sands have just said to us, he knows the vehicle. So I think they're going to have to disguise their vehicle, maybe a new paint job <laughs> or something in order to try and get closer to him. But what we're going to do is we are going to try and stay with him and get closer to him. I know this is a very difficult situation to wrap our heads around, but like I said earlier, the bottom line is if this animal is not treated, it will die. And not only will it die, it will potentially infect other animals, other leopards, other wild dogs. Who knows? The list is endless of, of how many animals could be infected by a rabies outbreak. So it's imperative that we do whatever it takes to inoculate them, even if it does mean giving him a little bit of a fright and clearly you can see his behavior has become a little bit different but would you rather have that or this young male leopard dying I'm just gonna let them know that I'm gonna try and loop ahead I'm just gonna try and loop ahead and see if we can get with them again and okay cool And oh, the good news is we're going to send you back to Jamie and that way we can focus on trying to help the Sabi Sands management get their job done here and we'll be sure to keep you updated on any updates along the way. Welcome back. And what a nice surprise as we were driving down the road away from the giraffe. Just maybe 50 meters down, I spotted the herd of elephants that we were looking for. Ooh, and that young bull just sent quite the grassy scent in our direction. That was quite an impressive example of their digestive system at work, complete with gaseous exchange that occurs within their small intestine so thank you for that mister he's quite at peace with himself it is a very thick block and most of the herd have moved off ahead of us it seems I'm not going to go trying to crash too far in but at least we've got the visual of this young bull I'm just sitting quietly for a moment just to try and get an idea or gauge where the rest of the herd is. And once again the Ellie's showing preference for the newly sprouting baboon's tail plant. feeling fairly camera shy but we've got some who are going to come up to us in a moment not just yet they're slowly making their way towards us look how beautiful tusks he's got and those are nice and big and thick even at his age and he's quite young I don't know I'm guessing at maybe 12 years old 
I think he's going to be rather large in the tusk department. Hey, big boy. Here we go. Onto the baboon's tail shoots. Completely relaxed. You can see how chilled out he is. Hey, big boy. And I read somewhere today that tusks can grow up to seven inches a year, which is, what is that? That's about 15 centimeters in one year. And some of that obviously gets worn down in the digging motion that they do. But over the next, he's got another 40 to 50 years of life during which those tusks are going to continue to grow. Oh, watch that trunk at work. Oh, baboon's tail plant gone. Apparently along with our elephant. He's shifted away behind us. Now he is right up close just behind us. He stopped right there, which kind of prevents me from repositioning the vehicle just because I don't want to startle him in any way. He's still chomping away right behind us quite happily, perfectly relaxed. I'm peering off into the bushes to see if we can spot any of the other members of the herd. And as he casually walks behind us, not too close, but he's just behind us so we can't move at all. The rest of the herd is ahead somewhere in a sort of general that direction. Um, there's quite a few moving through in here. I can hear them, I can't really see them. And then there's one or two members who are hiding out behind me and moving through. Here comes our young bull into view. Here we go, coming through. Not too sure if this is the same herd that we've been seeing over the last few days. I have to see one of the females that I can identify. Look at those incredible feet. Phenomenal to think how they walk right on the tips of their toes, up to six or seven tons of weight on the very tips of the phalanges, the, the sort of the finger-like and the toe-like bones. It's the most amazing structure. And there where he lifted his foot up so nicely for us, we could see those patterns of wrinkles that show up so beautifully clearly. Look, you can even see his toenails there. It's usually, they've got four toenails on the front, sometimes five. You do occasionally see Ellie's with five toenails. But really, one of the most amazing foot structures out here. Those toenails will definitely be kept worn down. And there's that magical instrument of the elephant's success. That trunk. I don't think I could ever get bored of sitting and watching elephants. There's just so much to see. Look at the wrinkles on their skin. Now it looks to me, I'm just having a look at his tusks now that we've seen them. They're nice and thick and broad. And typically a female of this age. Oh, baboon tails, flowers gone. <laughs> a female of this age would have much, much thinner tusks. You can see how much more the one on his right hand side, on your, the left of your screen, is much thicker but slightly shorter. I think 
Look at all those notches you can see as well from the branches. Hello, boy. Are we over your food? <laughs> Look at that beautiful eye and those ever important eyelashes as a way of protecting him from any sticks that might come through. <laughs> you can see just how close he's come. <laughs> We've got to the point where we are now observing a wall of elephant skin. Look at all the mud, the cracks, you can even see ants moving across him. Look at that incredible texture. It's almost prehistoric. And the veins in his ears and those vein patterns that he's got running through his ears, those will stay the same throughout his life. And they'll be a perfect way of identifying him. Such phenomenal animals. <laughs> and the wrinkly elbows, which I think might be my favorite part. Thank you, big boy, for your kindness in allowing us the close perusal. Mm -hmm. You want to come say hi? Nope, completely distracted by the boon's tail. Look how that intricate that little bit of trunk work was as he wrapped it around. He's been utilizing a combination of techniques here in his feeding on the baboon's tail. Sometimes he just strips the leaves. Other times, like right then, he just plucks the entire plant out. Stem and all. It apparently makes for a very crunchy, very nutritious breakfast. Or lunch, in this case. Dinner. Dinner. Sorry, it's getting later than I thought. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> One of the other females has come through a little bit. Using her feet combined with her trunk. I'm just going to be quiet for a moment as we listen to the crunching sounds that she's making. One coming up behind to see what mom has found. Oh. And I've seen that a lot with the baby elephants over the last few days that we've spent quite a considerable amount of time watching them. They wait until mom has found something good and then come rushing up to her to see what she's found and if it's better than whatever they're eating. suddenly realized that they've straggled behind the rest of the herd and it might be time to move on. There you go. It's almost like there was an invisible command there for him to turn and follow. I didn't hear anything but he moved off almost immediately. He's given us the perfect opportunity to see if we can reposition. It is very, very thick in here, and I'm not going to go crashing after them to the point that I stress them out in any way. But let's see if we can try and relocate the rest of the herd. I'm actually going to think about... Oh, I just spotted something out of the corner of my eye. It's a kudu. It's quite far away behind us. Well, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. 
Okay, let's see if we can reposition ourselves and get a nice view of these eddies once again. They've all run away. actually move across towards the road so I'm going to do a u-turn and switch around and move back onto the road and then see if we can loop in from around the front of them and while I do that I've got a really brilliant question from Tom now Tom was wondering if we can start to see the difference already in terms of their change of diet in their dung so from what they were relying on over the last few weeks in the dry season with a lot of roots and bark systems trying to get all of the nutrients they can from there to the now fresh green grass shoots and these fresh baboon tail shoots that we can see. And that's a really good idea. I'm going to see if I can try and grab hold of some fresh any done for us to have a look to answer Tom's question because yes I think that you probably could although it all kind of comes out the same color in the end. And I'll grab some old elephant dung as well because there's plenty of that lying around and we can have a look at and see for ourselves. It's not something that I've personally noted, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could tell. A change of diet is bound to have some kind of effect on their dung. Let's try and loop around. I can still see them moving off in the distance, but they are tucked right in a very thick block. Well caught wildebeest. Keep my eyes peeled for fresh Ellie dung versus older Ellie dung. But yes, Tom, I'm sure you could. What you will see over the next few months more than rather than weeks in terms of the change is they're gonna start switching their diet to include a lot more in the way of grass and that we will see clearly in the dung differences but for now it might be a little bit more tricky because it's still leaf based you can see them moving off in there it's the sort of last stragglers that we were with just dark gray shapes in the bush amazing how 50 meters in they almost disappear off You go, you get that flash of movement. Now, earlier on in that sighting, we had that young bull very, very close to us, and we've actually had quite a few close encounters over the last few days with the elephant herds that we've been with. And Carol from New York, welcome to the Sunset Safari. It's great to have you. You were wondering how you determine a nice relaxed elephant from one that is uncomfortable, or one that makes me feel uncomfortable when it's around me. And most of it is to do with their body language and their actions. Um, you can usually tell where an, an elephant's attention is focused. If they're feeding, their ears are flapping gently, gently mind. Their tails are slowly swinging. They're not looking too interested in what you're doing. That is what tells you you've got a relaxed elephant. If they are showing signs of displacement behavior, which is where they pretend to feed, they bring the food up to their mouths, but they kind of drop it out and they look at you out of the corner of their eye. That's when you start to wonder and then very often if they are slightly displeased with your presence, especially the females, they'll walk up to you with that I'm bigger than you look, with their ears open, their heads up, often looking down their noses at you. So a lot of it is very basic body language cues. But that also has to be read in conjunction with the knowledge of what that animal, the sort of the place of that animal 
in the herd dynamics. So yesterday with the young male, I wasn't worried at all. He was, although he came up to push his weight around and push boundaries, that is just what young bulls do. I'm gonna make sure I don't his tail. Although the Ellies do a perfectly good job of being destructive on that level as well. Stuck around that one. I'll leave it to the Ellies to have lunch here, or dinner, as Wildebeest says. Stop here for the moment and let them come to us. And I'll finish up with Carol's question. And Carol, if it was a female, um, especially if she starts coming at you with that big posture, like that one with our tusks did yesterday on the Sunset Safari, that's when I start to not necessarily get nervous, but I'm very aware of the fact that I need to be careful of how I behave in the herd. But I also strongly feel that there's a, they give you the feeling as to how they're feeling in, with your presence. I don't know how to explain it. It's just a sense that you get from them. They're either relaxed or they're not relaxed. And you can just feel it. It's a combination of experience and spending time with them. And then just watching their body language. If I duck down now, let's just have a look at this little one. It chose to walk to us, which is the first sign of a relaxed elephant. We didn't come up to it. Sorry, not it, her. Just looking at her now. She's quite contentedly feeding. It's not too hot, so her ears aren't going too much. But she's barely given us a second glance. That little flap wasn't based at us. It was just repositioning her ears. And you can see it perfectly clearly in that body language that she's happy and content no stress at all and it's something that you learn I'm sure that Carol you're familiar because being in a city you will be so familiar with the way that dogs show discomfort or cats show discomfort and reading elephant behavior, although they are very different animals, is fairly similar. It's just about learning which cues to look for. To have a look at us and then move past. There we go. Feeding right up close to us. And it's always better in an elephant sighting to never directly approach them. So you never drive straight at them, you let them come to you. Hello, little one. Now she's probably not much younger than that young bull that we saw at the start of the sighting. And you can see the clear difference in terms of both their size and their horn, well not their horn, their tusk growth. She's maybe a year or two younger than him. And at this point if you are in a sighting with an elephant like this, completely close up to us the most important thing to do is to keep your movements nice and slow because although she's quite comfortable with us if we were to jerk or if I was to lift my arm up she'd immediately get a fright and run away from us and of course we don't want that I'm sure many of you are picking up the bird calls in the distance there were magpie shrikes calling earlier but I think that one in particular is a fork-tailed drongo who are ever present at elephant sightings. It's such a perfect place to come and catch insects. Now for me it has been a week filled with elephant sightings. There's another female coming up here. 
She's not going to. She's going to move fairly close to all of these. She's going to stop and eat there. Now, for me, it has really been quite the week of elephant sightings. I know my girl. But it's also been the most incredible week for all sightings. It really, really has. So don't forget to join us for Fireside Chat this evening for the last half an hour of drive. We've got so much to show you and to talk about, from those incredible mating leopards to all of the goings on with that Ikuhuma lioness and those five Birmingham boys in her fairly successful peacekeeping mission that she appears to have brokered. And if you, do, if you guys do have any questions on those subjects that you would like to send through to us, then you can do so, and please do. You can send them through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we do really love hearing from you, and Fireside Chat just gives us those little additional moments to discuss the topics more in depth. Oh, lots of birds calling and lots of eddies all around us. The Franklins have also started their evening chorus. Don't forget I'm here, big girl. <laughs> Check that notch in her tusk. How cool is that? On the left-hand tusk, you can see clearly which tusk she favours to help her break branches. Here you can see where she's rubbed a groove in it. That one's perfectly smooth and then you get that perfect notch. Ooh, the fault lines, she's close enough we can see the fault lines and striations in her tusks. Awesome. go one of those special females with a slightly shortened trunk and look how coordinated she is with it even going for those tricky bits of baboon tail and I always do have really soft spots for elephants like this one you can see how close she's come to us <laughs> hi big girl almost like she doesn't know we're here. She's come right up to us. Perfectly calm. She's still eating her baboon's tail. She just decided that she wanted those bits. Thanks for that, my girl. Very cool. And there we have an answer to Carol's question. The perfect example of how you can tell whether an elephant is relaxed. She walked up to us with absolutely no threatening signs in her body language, perfectly, perfectly calm. She just wanted the patch of baboon tail that we happened to be right next to. And she was even kind enough that, although she wanted that bit right there, she was just going to stick herself slightly into a thorn tree to get it. And of course, we all really do have soft spots for those elephants like her with that slightly shortened trunk. I don't think it's the same one that I've seen before. I think this is a different elephant. And unfortunately, it is one of those sad things that that was almost inevitably caused in her younger years by getting caught in a human-laid snare. And it got to the point where it tightened on her trunk and cut off the blood supply. And she lost the dexterous tips of her trunk. But you can see she's perfectly healthy. She's keeping herself perfectly well fed. She's reached a nice, nice mature age. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her. It just might take her a little bit longer to wrap her trunk around the baboon's tail. I'm going to pretend that I'm not feeling that. Well, the beast, we're just going to pretend it's not drizzling. It's definitely not happening. If we pretend, then it's absolutely fine. <laughs> enough now. I mean it's been wonderful but you can hold off for just that little bit longer. <laughs> I'm just checking around me to see what our Ellie's are up to. We've got no more Ellie's in front of us. They are all now right behind us where VM can't film. 
So let's head across to Scott to see what he's been up to and I will catch up with you when I have repositioned. Welcome back everyone and can you believe your luck with Jamie and Vim with that elephant so so close to the vehicle. Awesome stuff and Andrew and I have just given up the search for Sindile who as you saw ran off from that vehicle and I guess you can't blame him at all really for that. I did chat with the Sabi Sands and get a better idea of what the plans are and what this whole process entails and we're going to discuss that at the fireside chats a little bit later and fill you in on all the info that they could give me. It is a great pity that this has to happen but the world we live in is far from perfect and it's just one of those things really. We should be back on the road in about a couple of minutes but I'm trying to take the easiest route there and let's hope this drizzle that has just descended upon us doesn't get too serious but even if it does we'll still be able to perform our chat with you guys it just may not be around the fireplace it may be on the off the hood of a vehicle but it's just a different opportunity for us to get together and chat and play you some wonderful wonderful highlights we've been incredibly lucky with the sightings we've had this week and the girls in final control Jess and Nikki have put together some wonderful slow motion clips of Tingana and Kwatile mating there's also some clips of the Birmingham boys trying to understand the art of mating with that one lioness Quick link, quick link, we need to send you across to something really cute. See you later. It is straight to the den site. You will absolutely not believe this. Because I don't. That is incredible. <laughs> We've got our hyena den site. Or at least the location of our hyena den site. I, I didn't even see it. I was looking back at the elephants and Nikki and FC actually pointed out, she said to me, what are these hyena doing? And they've stumbled into the elephant sighting and I believe these elephants have just led us to wherever the den is. That is so cool. I can't believe that. Just by sheer chance on Aubrey's Road, we have accidentally relocated the hyena den. Now the little ones just moved off further away from the Ellies. They've come out to investigate now that the elephants have moved away. And they have are oh, sniffing the air. I did see the younger one earlier. We've now got what looks to be the oldest cub. It's hard to tell. I haven't seen them in a while. And they grow so fast. But I just I cannot believe this happened. Totally fortuitous. Unbelievable. Hello, little one. Are you coming to say hello? It's, has it been a while since you've seen cars? Because you guys have been sneaky and disappeared. Well, that's a live safari for you. He's gone in front of my car. What are you doing? It is just the nature of the live safari. You just never know what to expect. Well, I certainly didn't expect that. That has been quite the surprise. I think that made my evening. Ah, uh, there we go. Well spotted, Vim. That little, little one, who is now looking much bigger since we last saw it. Right, now, here's where the hard work begins. We've got our starting position. Now, where is their den? Because they're bold enough and big enough now. And the older one's leading the younger one into mischief. Oh, gone. Where are you going? Where are you disappearing off to? 
But now we have to figure out exactly where it is that their den site is. I think it's likely that there's an adult around somewhere. Just by how bold they're being. <laughs> I just still can't get over this. That is unbelievable. Look how he's looking at the elephants. The elephants are just out of view. But they came out of curiosity. Okay. Well. Let's watch this little one disappear up the path and then loop around and follow them and try and figure out exactly where this den site has been hiding. How exciting is that? Totally by chance. We knew they were in this area, or we guessed they were in this area, but I certainly didn't expect to be led to a hyena den by elephants. That's definitely a first for me. Let's try and do this nice and carefully so that I don't scare them in any way, but that we can figure out exactly where this den site is. We're looking for a big termite mound with lots of holes in it. This is a perfect gate path for them. There's the little one there. Let's see where he's going. They're going to, there's a very good chance they are going to lead us right to the den. Keep this nice and slow. We're looking for, as I said, termite mounds with big holes, nibbled sticks around them, lots of hyena dung. Yep, there we go. The latrine that marks the spot. The white evidence of hyena dung. Our little ones just skittered off that way. You've got a big one. Liam, you're a genius. Okay. Let's figure this out. Now there's a termite mount there, there's a termite mount here. This is their den. I'm going to try and give it a bit of a berth. There's definitely a good chance we're going to. Yep, this looks about right. That little hole there. Let's just stop here for a moment and see if anybody pops out. I'm looking to see what evidence there is around. It definitely looks like a freshly activated hole. There we go, another one's coming out to peek around the side. Hello. Is this where you guys have been hiding? Hey? Aren't you sneaky? Coming up once again to say hello. Oh, this has been an exciting afternoon for you. Elephants are now people and cars to chew on. Oh, what's that little one got? A hoof. You found a hoof. Well done. Look how big it's looking. Spots and everything. And a perfect chew toy for a growing hyena. <laughs> nope, you may not have that. I'm going to run around. There's probably another entrance behind there. There we go, as they disappear around. I'm just investigating my options here. Now, obviously in terms of hyena den etiquette, I'm not going to be driving right on top of them. But I think probably our best approach is going to be to loop around the other side, so behind the den. I'm almost certain that this is our nice new fresh den site. This is so cool. What a special moment. Liam, are you going to GPS where we are? Well Perfect, thank you. Well, that was a nice surprise. Apparently, Liam saw an adult. I didn't, but Liam saw an adult just off here. So they are around. And that would explain the drag mark that Aubrey said he saw earlier coming from Buffel's Hook to the south. Sorry, there, just dodge that tree. Let's 
not going to be the easiest den to get into. You're going to have to do a bit of 20 point turns to loop around. But still, how amazing is this? just moved in the last two weeks they've only moved their den site recently hopefully they're going to stick around at this den for a little bit longer it's in a nicer position than that other one was the one on Gallego shortcut was very very tricky to get into this one's a little bit tricky but we're going to manage we just have to take a slightly longer route around you can see them now lying outside the entrance to the den, so they are there. This is definitely the right termite mound. Ducks and branches. Oh. Just acquired a log under the wheel. They're okay though. Wow, what a nice surprise. Pardon? That's a, it's a very nice neighborhood. Comes with siblings, there's the mom. Any stop here to give you just so that you can orient it to, orientate yourself. I think Wildebeest is right, they've moved to the nice neighborhood. Here we go. Just to give you a bit of orientation before I find us a nice view, I'm going to have to stick my nose in there's quite a lot of fallen trees they really have found a perfectly protected area three what looks like three little ones and two ad or one adult in fact that looks like an adult to me sorry slightly balding and there's mom the matriarch off to the right We're definitely missing two cubs, but it could be that as things started to get a little bit crowded, the one mother decided to move to a different den site. I don't think that's unheard of, especially at the age that the cubs are getting to. So one was born, the oldest one was born at the end of December, which would make it about nine months old. The twins, who were just below that, that we used to see, were around seven months old, so born in February. And then the little, little one, who's starting to look not so little. Oh, hold on. I think there is another one there. Okay, let me try and reposition so we can see. There we go. I can see little cub legs moving. Okay, so we are only missing one cub, as far as I can tell. There, I can see that one suckling there with mom. Oh, too cute. What a nice moment. With these guys moving Basically, I think I saw them maybe once or twice at the den site on Gallego Shortcut before they moved again. So I'd only just got back and they moved again. They'd only been there for about two weeks. And John from Atlanta, welcome to the Sunset Safari. I hope you're as thrilled as I am about finding the new active den site. This has been an awesome twist to the evening. Now John was wondering how often they move. And that depends on the circumstances and it depends on the den. Now the cubs are getting a little bit larger, so obviously the pest buildup, the amount of waste matter that's building up around the den is increasing the bigger that they get. So it means that they might have to move a little bit more frequently. But it also could have been that, especially after the big rains, 
that den got a little bit waterlogged and a bit unpleasant for them and they decided to just head out and find somewhere on slightly more open, slightly higher ground because that den was almost on a drainage line. So it might have been that water was seeping down towards the drainage line, just making a rather uncomfortable situation. So it just depends on the circumstances as well as the level of parasite and sort of smell buildup that's happening around the den. What I want to do is try and stick my nose in here, the nose of the vehicle that is, not my nose. I know exactly how pungent a hyena den is. I don't need to be any closer to smell it. But I want to try and reposition so we can get a nice view. This is never going to be an easy den to get into just because of the number of fallen logs. But still, such a thrill to have found it. I think that's about as good as we're going to get for now. We can have a look. I'm just going to position the light so we can have some light as it starts to get a bit darker. And we're just looking at these tiny little cubs. I cannot believe how much the littlest one has grown. It is mind boggling. But just looking at their sizes, Judith from North Carolina was wondering if I could compare it to a breed of dog. Judith, give me a moment to just think about that. I'm just trying to work it out in my head. Hyena, adult female hyenas are big. They're a good over 120 pounds or 60 kilograms. There's another adult coming in on the path. We found their very regularly used pathway. That's perfect. I'll duck my head down. There we go. I've got a nice example of an adult coming in. And I'd probably say something like just smaller than a bull mastiff. They are very, they can be very heavy animals. I'm trying to think of a good example. Maybe about the height of a German Shepherd, but they are very bulky. And the little ones, despite their size, are very, very, what's the word, stockily built. They're compact little creatures. Oh, a little bit of a tussle there. Here we go. Some greetings happening. was interesting. Quite a dominant display from that newcomer. And interestingly enough, the female that we think of as the matriarch has just run away. She has, I doubt she would have gone far, but she's just disappeared off into the bush. That's very interesting. Oh, big yawn. Now we have to try and puzzle out what's happening here. The noises that you were hearing were coming both... Actually, those noises that you're hearing now are coming from the adult lying down. The female who was suckling the cub. gentle sniffing going on all around. That's very typical of hyena greeting ceremonies. Oh, little cub's not sticking around to get a nip. There's the, the one lying down with a piercing in her ear. That's the mother of the twins. I'm not too sure who this adult is who's come in. 
but she's come in with very dominant body language. I didn't see the scar on her back. Chasing one of the cubs off. And now she's gone off, I think, to look for that other adult who was lying down on the side of the den, who I thought was the, the youngest cub's mother, who we've always suspected to be the matriarch. Just listening to their sounds. They're going to come back towards the den, which is why I'm not rushing off to reposition. They're going to move back towards us. And if I go crashing through that thick block, it's going to disturb them. You can see this one mother is still very alert to whatever's happening. And she's up. Awesome stuff. Those territorial contact calls, that typical whooping sound of the adult females, letting everybody know that this is where they are and this is their turf. And not everybody, I'm talking specifically about other hyena clans. And these clans are very territorial. What a wonderful, lucky surprise this has been. I know that Scott is busy setting up for fireside chat, but we're going to try and stay here for as long as possible just to get an idea as to what's happening. I wonder if that little cub is going to follow the others. If it does disappear, then I'm going to try and relocate them. It is very, very thick in there. I don't want to go bashing around with young cubs. I'm going to try and loop around, rather. But even that in itself was an interesting sighting. Whoop, up we go. Over the logs. Hop, hop. Okay, let me see if I can relocate wherever they've gone. They've moved into a very, very thick block. Let's try and loop around, otherwise we'll come back to the den site. The cubs are not going to go too far, especially as it starts to get dark. They'll stick around here, but let's see if we can relocate them. And if we can't, then we've always got the wonderful prospect of fireside chat. Let's just see if we can catch up with them. Either way, we've had a momentous breakthrough today. Hyena Den, relocated. So I do this carefully. At least it is slightly more open than the previous one that they chose on Gallego Shortcut. They've got good taste in den sites. you a rough idea as to distance as well in terms of how far they moved from the original den that was on Philemon's cut line and then to the Gallego shortcut den. I am looping around so that we don't make this noise close to the cubs. Now the Philemon's cut line den to the Gallego shortcut den was probably the greatest distance that they moved. That was about Maybe three kilometers, I'd have to double check on my map. In 
terms of this distance, it's much, much shorter. They've moved maybe 700 meters from that den on Gallego shortcut, so not too far. And I strongly suspect that in this particular case, the move was related to the rain. They moved because that den was on a drainage line, it's getting waterlogged and it was time to go. It's interesting how much we've learned from just a few months of watching active hyena dens. How cool is that? Here we go, there's one coming towards us actually. Or is it going to stop? This is the thick block that I wanted to skirt. I didn't want to move right up to them just because it is, they do have about three cubs wandering around. We don't want to stress them out in any way. Hello, little one. Positioning our light so that we can see a little bit better. It is so great to see these cubs again. I really have missed them. And for those of you who don't know, spotted hyena are probably my favorite animals, or at least my favorite predators out here, just because they have such a level of <laughs> curiosity and they are so entertaining. Down here. What are you up to, little one? I love the way that they'll come up and investigate your wheels and sometimes even take a bite out of them. Listen, that's bad manners, don't you, Mataya? Hello. <laughs> that is what I love the most about them. They just have so much going on in terms of their social structure and their social communication. Such entertaining little animals. They really are phenomenal. Now the rest of the adults have disappeared. I think I can see one through the bush there. That's I think where this little cub is looking. I'm going to try and do a loop around and see if we can get to them. And if we can't do that, then we will head across to Fireside Chat. I will GPS the den location and then head across to Fireside Chat. Either way, we've made a major breakthrough and we've got a place to start for the Sunrise Safari. Let me try and reposition one last time and see what's happening with our hyenas. Just since we haven't seen them in such a long time, it's so, so exciting. distance just around this fallen knob form and that was definitely a good way to end an afternoon there we go Look at this 
peaceful family scene. And the hyenas that we haven't seen in such a long time. And if you are new to our live safaris, maybe you're joining us for the first time, the fact that we have found this hyena den on their active site means that we can spend a lot more time watching them and getting to learn the different dynamics that they have in this area. And it really is one of the most entertaining animals to watch. <laughs> 